time collapses between the lips of strangers. My days collapse into a hollow tube, soon implodes against now like an iron wall. My eyes are blocked with rubble, a smear of perspectives, blurring each horizon in the breathless precision of silence. One word is made. Once the renegade flesh was gone, fall air lay against my face, sharp and blue as a needle. But the rain fell through October, and death lay, a condemnation within my blood. The smell of your neck in August, a fine gold wire bejeweling war. All the rest lies elusive as a farmhouse on the other side of a valley, vanishing in the afternoon. Day three, day four, day ten. The seventh step. A veiled door leading to my golden anniversary. Flame-proofed, free paper shredded in the teeth of a pillaging dog. Never to dream of spiders. And when they turn the hoses upon me, a burst of light. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, a podcast about poetry. Each week, I read a poem, look at its inner workings, and hopefully show you what makes it tick. This week's poem is Never to Dream of Spiders by Audre Lorde. Before I begin, I have a suggestion. Try to find a copy of the poem somewhere before you listen, so that you can read along. If you're having difficulty finding one, you'll find it linked below in the description. Feminism in poetry is nothing new, nor is race in poetry. The question of forming identity through poetry is still discussed today. In many ways, poetry seems to have been made as a means to give voice to the outsider. Despite much of the above being tried and true statements, there is no one that seemed to exemplify all of these different reasons for poetry quite the way Audre Lorde did. Audre Lorde was a poet and activist for much of her life. She wrote extensively on the topics of race, gender, queerness and power. Her work is intensely autobiographical in places. She often drew on her own life and difficulties to illustrate much broader points. As a huge advocate for intersectional feminism, she wrote tirelessly to try and change the minds of many. In the words of academic Alison Kimmich, throughout all of Audre Lorde's writing, both non-fiction and fiction, a single theme surfaces repeatedly. The black lesbian feminist poet activist reminds her readers that they ignore differences among people at their peril. Instead, Lord suggests differences in race or class must serve as a reason for celebration and growth. Lord saw poetry as a way to promote and nourish that inclusion. She often waxed lyrical on the ability of poetry to bring people together. Here she is in an interview in 1976 speaking on that very subject. I think that when I get the most, the audience gets the most too. And it's a mutual, it's almost a ritual of shared emotional experience. There is a touching, a strengthening of what I'm trying to do with my poetry and a, a connection between people, which I believe is what poetry is all about. That drawing on shared emotion and strengthening is ever present in the poem I've chosen for this week's podcast. That shared experience helps us to understand some of the poem. But to truly understand its weight and significance, we have to understand Audre Lorde's life and eventual death. Perhaps the academic Benjamin Voigt put it best when he wrote, The one word that haunts this poem, that it hints at without disclosing, is a life-changing one. Cancer. This brief hallucinatory lyric from 1986 captures the moment she was diagnosed with liver cancer, which eventually claimed her life. 
This poem is a way of Lord wrestling and eventually coming to terms with the illness that was attacking her body. She had suffered from cancer before and she documented the experience in her lauded work, The Cancer Journals. In these journals, Lord reflected on pain and the clarity it can bring. She ruminated on the power her voice could have, if only she let it. She writes of the restrictive quality of fear, but more importantly than any of that, she wrote of how each of these challenges bears wonderful fruit when overcome. One can only imagine the difficulty of learning that cancer had come back. The sheer disbelief that the suffering she had once conquered was about to start all over again. This is the precise struggle that Lord is wrestling with in the poem in different aspects. The first stanza, for example, is the dissolution of time that occurs in the face of the illness. Time collapses between the lips of strangers. My days collapse into a hollow tube, soon implodes against now like an iron wall. My eyes are blocked with rubble, a smear of perspectives blurring each horizon in the breathless precision of silence. One word is made. You would be forgiven for thinking that the poem was beginning by focusing on lovers. There is an almost sensual image of lips there. And yet, within that strange opening line, there is chaos. And yet, within these strange opening lines, there is chaos. Time is collapsing, which is a panic-inducing image. It is a very romantic, almost naive thought when applied to lovers. The idea that time passes as freely when we are happy and in love. However, once the imagery of cancer enters the poem, the initial image takes on a far more sinister tone. The lips of strangers of which she speaks are not lovers, but the doctors delivering her diagnosis. Their words, a detonation with awful fallout. The mention of the hollow tube is a referencing to the medical equipment of chemotherapy, and in invoking it, a strange, leeching tension strikes the reader. Lord is experiencing a serious displacement, a warping of time. Her days have collapsed, and she feels trapped in now, as though up against an iron wall. All the hope she had for the future seems to have vanished. Now, even opening her eyes seems impossible. The smear of perspectives and blurring horizon all happen in a doctor's office. The clear image of her future is smudged and stripped away by their words. The awkward silence that comes in the wake of such terrible news is made clear by the line, its breathless precision. It cuts the speaker. The one word that's made, as pointed out by Voigt earlier, is cancer. And it is truly devastating. Perhaps the only thing worse than finding out you have cancer is finding out you have it again. The second stanza makes this sentiment very clear. Once the renegade flesh was gone, fall air lay against my face, sharp and blue as a needle, but the rain fell through October, and death lay a condemnation within my blood. The renegade flesh here is a reference to the tumour that once lay within Lord's body. A part of her that would not obey, would not exist in harmony with the rest. That said, she had been freed of it. It had been removed. The relief she felt during that time is made clear. She felt the early autumn wind on her face. The early autumn wind, however, would turn to betrayal as she mentions that the rain was relentless in October. If you've ever heard mention of the phrase pathetic fallacy, this is it. The moment in a work of fiction or literature when the weather reflects the character's mood or works as an omen of terrible things to come. In this case, it signals the return of terrible things. 
her body would be betrayed once more by a silent waiting thing. Death, in this case, lay as a condemnation, an insult to her own belief of health and recovery. There is something very insidious and unnerving in the words, within my blood. The notion that the seeds of our own passing may lie dormant within us is enough to unnerve anyone. And yet, this horrible feeling is exactly what Audre Lorde is contending with. She wrote of that struggle often in the cancer journals. Here is an extract from them, which I think illustrates it perfectly. I want to write rage, but all that comes is sadness. We have been sad long enough to make this earth either weep or grow fertile. I am an anachronism, a sport, like the bee that was never meant to fly. Science said so. I am not supposed to exist. I carry death around in my body like a condemnation. But I do live. The bee flies. There must be some way to integrate death into living, neither ignoring it nor giving into it. We see there that the seeds of this poem are within that extract. The condemnation of death is clearly a recurring image for Lord. Within that extract too is the strange paradox of being both alive and not. That anxiety of the enemy within seems to have stuck with Lord and revealed itself once more. The relief she felt at the removal of the original illness has turned sour now. The third stanza of the poem sees her slipping into warmer memory. The smell of your neck in August, a fine gold wire bejeweling war all the rest lies elusive as a farmhouse on the other side of a valley, vanishing in the afternoon. We experience another season change, and the poem now talks of August. The colder months are reserved for the grim reality of her cancer, while summer seems to be kept for the moments she cherishes. Romance enters the poem in earnest this time, as Lord speaks of the intimate knowledge of another scent. This is a fine gold bejeweling war. Her choice of words here, as striking as they are obscure. The war she speaks of is, to me, a testament to just how vivid this glimpse of her lover's neck is. It is at war with the misery of her recent news. The fine gold and bejeweling likening the happy memory to jewellery that she can adorn herself with. Unfortunately, it seems to be the only memory that is clear and easy. She goes on to describe how other such moments seem just out of her reach. They are as elusive as a farmhouse at dusk. The image is striking in its sadness. Yet again, hope is fading for the speaker slipping away from them, like time and their well-being in the previous two stanzas. So, by the end of the third stanza, we have lost time, health, and hope. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that this poem would end with sheer misery at its core. However, stanza four seems to rally itself. The poet pushes further into memory and melds her present misery with her early life. Day three, day four, day 10, the seventh step, a veiled door leading to my golden anniversary, flame-proofed free paper shredded in the teeth of a pillaging dog, never to dream of spiders. And when they turn the hoses upon me, a burst of light. When looking at the poem in print, readers will notice the huge gaps between day 3, day 4, day 10. It is a literal jumping of time. The days are blurring together, simply whipping by at an alarming pace. 
The uneven spacing forces the reader to lurch and jump through the poem. To lurch and jump through the poem, mimicking Lord's own action. Lord then references the seventh step, and it has stumped me a little. I searched to find some kind of meaning for it, and came up with two possibilities. One possibility is that it is the seventh step in the Alcoholics Anonymous program. In that seventh step, participants are asked to pray to the Lord for the strength and fearlessness to conduct a moral inventory and accept their own defects. Whilst Lord is certainly taking stock of her life, I simply don't think it fits. Upon further research, I found the seven stages of recovery after the remission of cancer. Step seven here is looking forward. For me, this fits far better, as this poem is bearing witness to Lord's future vanishing before her. We are treated to a glimpse of what Lord thought would happen. Her golden anniversary is both an acknowledgement of her upcoming 50th birthday, which is now veiled or dampened. It could also be seen as a recognition of the fact that she could have had 50 years together with her partner, which she will never see now. The final stanza suddenly veers rapidly in imagery and content. That shared experience I spoke about earlier in the episode is brought to the fore and drawn on heavily. Rather than looking forward, the final five lines look firmly back. Flame-proofed, free paper shredded in the teeth of a pillaging dog. Never to dream of spiders. And when they turn the hoses upon me, a burst of light. The poem has transported us back to the American civil rights movement of the 60s. But more than that, the poem taps into the black experience in America as a whole. The flame-proofed free paper shredded in the teeth of a pillaging dog that Lord references speaks of the papers issued to freed slaves to certify that they were no longer owned or thought of as property. This precaution was taken should they catch the eye of a slave catcher on their travels. The pillaging dogs references the dogs that were set on protesters in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. This escalation and subsequent riot came to define the civil rights movement in that era. Both references meld together to become a powerful symbol. The free papers, which should have represented unassailable liberty and relief to the people who bore them, turned out to be frail in the face of other people's bigotry. Lord's hope for a cancer-free life proved frail in reality. Following that is the titular line, never to dream of spiders. Easily the most cryptic of all the lines in the poem. There are two interpretations that could be made here. Spiders are often associated with tombs and decay. So, in saying never to dream of spiders, Lord may be implying that things cut short, such as freedom papers, or say, a life, will never have to fear the ravages of time. Another interpretation, one that leads far more into the interpretation of dreams, is that spiders are often considered to be a symbol for building. The webs they weave are a perfect allegory about how humans build their lives and homes around them, both in the present and in the future. Here, Lord could be saying once more that she will never have to worry about that future or dream of those spiders. The final lines of this stanza are oddly hopeful and jar with the rest of the poem. The Birmingham riots are referenced once more, and this time it is the way in which powerful fire hoses were used to target and injure helpless protesters. Lord herself was a part of many of these civil rights protests and suffered the same actions at the hands of others. Hence the phrase, they turned their hoses upon me. What happened in this poem, however, is not an injury that disheartens, but quite the opposite. There is a burst of light, a blaze of power and defiance, far from dampening her, far from dampening her zeal about equality. The hoses only serve to fortify it. Perhaps Audre Lorde fully intended 
to stand in the face of this new cancer, just as she had in various protests, and tragically was unable to. So, why this poem? Audre Lorde was always a clear and powerful voice for equality and intersectionality. Whenever she saw a social imbalance, she spoke up. This poem exemplifies exactly that. Even when gripped with cancer, she uses that grim moment to speak of the plight of others. I could write about this all day, but I think this quote from the Cancer Journals sums up the reason I respect her and her work more than my own words ever could. In this quote, Lord examines the pathetic comfort that prosthesis offers some women after a mastectomy. Prosthesis offers the empty comfort of nobody will know the difference. But it is that very difference which I wish to affirm because I have lived it and survived it and wish to share that strength with other women. If we are to translate the silence surrounding breast cancer into language and action against this scourge, then the first step is that women with mastectomies must become visible to each other. For silence and invisibility go hand in hand with powerlessness. For me, Audre Lorde is a woman who refused to be silenced and so never lost her power. What's your reading of the poem? I'd like to point out, as always, that this is my interpretation and as such, very much up for debate. If you'd like to talk to me about it, you can reach me in a few ways. Send me an email at wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com You can find my website, www.wordsthatburnpodcast.com where you'll also find the show notes for this episode, complete with references. If none of that suits you, I'm on Instagram. Just search Words That Burn Podcast. There you can find helpful study guides and bonus material as well. This episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music in this week's episode is by Scott Buckley and is used under Creative Commons license. If you've been enjoying the podcast, or you think someone else might, please consider giving me a review on whatever platform you listen on, or sharing it directly with your friends. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to me, and hopefully you'll hear from me again soon.